the west coast let me click this uh thanks for everyone especially on the west coast who had to wake up early for this i empathize with you when i am on the west coast so uh thanks for coming to this it's my pleasure to introduce mayar katai koi i hope i said that properly um uh, Mayar is going to uh, to talk to us today about geometric and spectral biases in gener generative adversarial networks. Uh, Mayar is a, is a PhD has a PhD from uh, Rutgers University in computer science. Uh, he used to work with uh, Ahmed Al Gamal, and he has a, a bachelor in electric a bachelor of science in electrical engineering and control systems from the University of Tehran. Um, he is currently a research scientist at Live Person, working on end-to-end multi-domain dialogue systems. And his interests are um, in general in, uh, is in understanding the limitations of deep neural networks in the context of generative models. Mayar, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Lil, and uh, thank you for having me here, it's a pleasure. Uh, so uh, basically, in this talk, I'm going to talk, like discuss some of the biases in generative adversarial networks. And the reason uh, this is important is because GANs uh, have proven to be one of the uh, most successful generative models of recent years, and they're being used in uh, many applications. So it's important to know what are their biases and limitations and how to deal with them. Uh, so also, if you have questions, just feel free to uh, speak up or also try to like stop at certain points to like uh, uh, give you a chance to ask questions. Um, so I'm gonna start by a quick overview of distribution learning and how GANs fit into this picture. Uh, the main uh, problem here is we want to determine an unknown uh, probability distribution given a limited number of observations from it. And this has a, uh, many applications. For example, we might have a partially a complete image, we want to uh, fill in the missing parts, or we want to construct a high resolution image from a low resolution uh, observation, or we might want to, for example, complement and grow a small data set by finding the underlying distribution of data and many other applications. Uh, so the classic approach to distribution learning is density estimation. Uh, so let's say these uh, blue dots on the left bottom left of the slide, these are our observation uh, in some space X. Uh, in this case, density estimation assumes that there exists a uh, non-negative function uh, here shown in red, uh, such that if we take its uh, integral uh, in a region, we'll get the probability of samples coming from that region. And then there are uh, two main ways to model this function. Uh, we have a uh, parametric density estimation, where we uh, can uh, we assume an analytic uh, family of density functions, uh, for example, our uh, Gaussians or mixture of Gaussians, and then we try to uh, optimize their parameters to maximize some uh, measure of divergence or likelihood uh, of our observations. And then we have a non-parametric density estimation where we essentially start by assuming a, a kernel as a notion of closeness, and then we define this density function at each point uh, based on the closeness to our observations. So the closer uh, a point is to what we have observed, we uh, assign it a higher uh, density based on this notion of closeness. Uh, the problem with density estimation methods, uh, the ones I discussed here, uh, is first that we have an approximation error because it's hard to uh, choose an analytic family of densities that is both uh, expressive enough, it can, be, uh, it can represent any uh, density, and also is tractable so we can compute it. Uh, the second problem is curse of dimensionality with kernel density estimation because uh, any notion of uh, closeness that is tight enough uh, and we like represent it with a kernel starts to kind of collapse as we go towards higher dimensions. And that means we will need uh, an exponentially more number of samples to uh, build a, a correct density essentially. Uh, but basically, uh, the maybe the like uh, most fundamental issue is that some distributions just don't have densities. For example, uh, if you consider a distribution supported on this uh, red curve here, uh, since this uh, red curve in the 2D plane has measure zero, so its volume is zero, uh, it does not have a density. So uh, density estimation methods basically need to assume a uh, non-measure zero cover for it and learn that which uh, will not be uh, accurate enough and this situation becomes worse as we go to higher dimensions. 
Uh, a, a real life uh, example of this situation is, for example, uh, national images or like images faces in this case. Uh, these uh, faces, uh, they come from, for example, a 64 by 64 by three, uh, a huge pixel of space, but they don't fill up the whole space. They fall on a low dimensional manifold, which has therefore a measure zero and uh, doesn't have a density to be uh, learned by these density estimations. Uh, so we can, uh, to, to address these challenges, we can take a purely generative perspective where we just try to learn a function that uh, receives some noise from some known distribution, like a normal, uh, like a standard normal distribution, and just gives us samples from the distribution that we want to learn. So in this way, uh, learning this function, we're implicitly uh, learn, basically learning the uh, true distribution that we wanted to learn. And this is the perspective that uh, generative adversarial networks take. Uh, so they form a, a two-player game between a generative, uh, between a generator, which is a function that uh, I just described, and another function, a uh, discriminator D, which is essentially a scoring function. So uh, in this game, D is optimized to increase its value on uh, real samples. These are samples from the distribution that we want to learn and decrease its samples on uh, its uh, score on samples that come from the generated uh, uh, model, from the generative model. And uh, in this way, essentially B is uh, scoring real uh, distribution higher than the generated distribution. Uh, and then uh, G is optimized to essentially move its samples towards uh, uh, the regions that uh, D has assigned higher values to. Now, if we uh, either, uh, if we basically let this uh, game complete uh, under some assumptions, we can show that the generator will learn the correct distribution. So this is an example of again trained on uh, a data set of faces, and these are some uh, basically sixteen samples from the generator at different stages during training. You can see that gradually uh, it will start to generate samples that more, look more like faces. And that's kind of uh, to get an idea of uh, what happened, what, how does this training move on, things forward. Uh, so now a quick look at the actual GAN objective. So on the top, we have the original GAN objective that was proposed by Goodfella and uh, team. Um, here, essentially, like we have a log likelihood uh, as defined by uh, the, the scoring function D uh, over the true samples. And uh, we have a log likelihood over uh, the generated samples. And the objective uh, for D, as we just uh, uh, discussed, would be to increase this objective, which essentially is just increasing D on uh, true samples and decreasing D on generated samples. And then the objective for G is to instead minimize this objective at the optimal D. So it's essentially a min max optimization. Now, since this objective is convex in D, uh, the function space of D, uh, we can find the optimal form of D root which would be like that. And then we, if we put this uh, optimal form into uh, this objective to get basically this uh, uh, term, uh, we'll see that it's equal to uh, a constant plus the genesis and divergence between the uh, real distribution and the generated distribution. And what this means is that when the generator tries to minimize this objective, it is basically minimizing genesis and divergence. And since genesis and divergence is only minimized when the two distributions are equal, that means the generator will uh, retrieve the correct, correct uh, distribution that we wanted to learn. Now there's a problem here, and that's the fact that uh, genesis and divergence uh, is only sensitive to the amount of overlap between the distribution. So in the top case and the bottom case, uh, these cases are both equally like far in the eyes of uh, genesis and divergence. Uh, to address that, uh, another variety of GANs was introduced, which is called Wasserstein GAN. Uh, it's essentially the same idea, uh, except with a different loss, which will, uh, at optimal discriminator, will become uh, an approximation to the uh, Wasserstein distance shown here. Uh, and a good thing about Wasserstein distance is that it's sensitive to the actual distance between the support of two distributions. So it will uh, score this one lower than this one. Uh, and there's only like one uh, consideration here for this approximation to work. We need to make sure that uh, since uh, in this uh, definition of the Wasserstein distance, F is a one Lipschitz function, we need to control the slope of D to also be close to one Lipschitz. And that's achieved either by creeping a weight in D or more uh, correctly actually, uh, by putting a regularizer uh, directly on the uh, gradient of D to make sure that it's 
uh, slope uh, remains uh, close to one. I'm sorry. Uh, yep, and uh, so all the things we discussed about, uh, they work given two uh, main assumptions. The first assumption is that D and G, uh, these two functions have unlimited capacity so they can represent anything. And the second one is that uh, the optimization is performed in the space of D and G, which is uh, with respect to which the uh, uh, objective is convex. So that's why we could uh, write down uh, what uh, the optimal D would look like. Uh, but what happens in practice is we model D and G with deep neural networks and under universal approximation theorem, we can guarantee uh, kind of their unlimited capacity. But then the optimization is happening in the parameter space of DNG, which is no longer uh, convex, and it, like the optimization becomes highly non-convex. So we get local optima, and that's why we need good optimizers and regularization and normalizations to avoid uh, like bad optima. And so that concludes a very uh, a quick, a very uh, like hasty uh, introduction into GANs. Uh, so we can start now talking about the first bias. Uh, so I think like. I want to like pause here for maybe a minute, just if there's any questions at this point before we jump into the biases. Uh, okay, uh, looks good. Uh, and uh, all right. So basically the, uh, the first uh, question that we want to ask is, can GANs learn a distribution supported on a disconnected uh, manifold? Uh, here, basically, we can see an example of a connected manifold on top in uh, blue. Uh, and you can see an example of a disconnected manifold, which is essentially a union of uh, disjoint, compact, connected manifolds. So disjoint so that like they're, they're not overlapping, uh, connected so that they cannot break down to like more submanifolds, and compact so that they cannot be arbitrarily close to one another. Uh, and to motivate why we care about this kind of distribution, uh, imagine we have a uh, like picture of a bird and picture of a cat here. And we want, and we want to uh, continuously transform the bird into a cat without ever generating an image that's neither bird nor cat. So if you think about that, uh, it's kind of not possible at some point we'll end up generating something that's kind of a mashup of a cat and a bird. So like a cat with a beak or a bird with ears. Uh, and uh, so what that means is that if you have a, a data set of natural images containing birds and cats, that distribution is actually supported on a disconnected manifold. And it actually happens a lot in practice. It's not just uh, uh, data sets that have uh, very clearly defined classes, like different classes in them. Uh, so that's kind of the motivation here. Uh, but uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, so coming back to the assumption of uh, unlimited capacity that we had before for GND, uh, there are two caveats to discuss here. First one is that uh, approximation, uh, universal approximation theorem uh, is only for continuous functions. So it does not guarantee that DNG can learn uh, discontinuous functions. And then in practice, we actually explicitly uh, regularize uh, the, uh, these uh, neural networks uh, to prevent them from becoming uh, basically uh, ill-conditioned or, or be, uh, and, and what that means is that they essentially are uh, very strictly continuous and they have a very like uh, smooth slope uh, in practice. So taking that into uh, account, uh, we now look at a basic theorem of topology written in the, in the first line here, which says that a continuous function keeps the connectedness of the space intact. What that means for GANs is that since the latent distribution that we start from, for example, it's not a standard normal or uniform, has connected support, and we apply a neural network, which is also con quite continuous, uh, we end up like, generating a distribution that also has a connected support. So to make that more clear, uh, imagine we want to learn this distribution shown at the bottom of the slide. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor, right? I should have confirmed that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes? We do. Yeah, okay, good. I panicked for a moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, to generate, we want to generate this distribution. Um, and this is essentially uh, plus two and minus two with equal probability. Now, ideally what we want our uh, uh, generator to learn as a function that goes from Z to X is 
this function shown here in red. So that when we uniformly sample between plus one and minus one, we only get plus two and minus two and nothing else. Uh, but essentially when we want to learn this with a uh, quite like a smooth function, we end up learning something like this curve in the blue, which means that now when we sample uniformly between plus one and minus one, we end up getting plus twos and minus twos, but also all the values in between. So we end up getting like 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1 1.2, all that things. And these will be essentially off manifold samples uh, that our model is generating. So looking at the consequences of this, the first consequence is what we just discussed. Uh, basically the generator, since it can only learn a connected manifold, will try to cover all sub-manifolds of a disconnected, uh, of a distribution supported on disconnected uh, uh, manifold uh, uh, as one globally connected manifold. So here we have uh, another example that we'll continue to see moving on as well. So here the data set is supported on these uh, four line segments. So, we, and we are basically samples come from each of these line segments with equal probability. And on this data set, when we train a WGAN model, we get this thing as the generated output. So here we are just generating uh, 10,000 uh, samples from the generator. And you can see that it has learned essentially a cover. So it's generating the uh, line segments, but it's also generating uh, basically con connecting regions. And these are uh, essentially uh, off manifold uh, samples, uh, which would correspond to low quality samples that we really don't want our model to be generating. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, moving forward, uh, the other consequence is uh, something that's called mode dropping. So, mode dropping is a situation where uh, some sub manifolds of true data uh, is not completely covered by the generator. So uh, here, imagine the data is supported on these two red line segments on the left. Now, in this case, uh, since the generator has to learn a, a cover of these two line segments, uh, there are different covers that it can learn. I'm showing uh, three examples in these illustrations. Uh, uh, like the blue uh, shaded area is the cover that the generator is learning, the connected cover. Uh, so the generator here is basically in a trade-off because it wants to cover uh, uh, as much of uh, the sub-manifold as possible, but it also wants to generate as much, uh, like uh, a lesser amount of up-manifold uh, regions. So it wants to minimize these up-manifold regions uh, and uh, cover as much uh, uh, of the sub-manifolds as possible. What that means is that it might end up uh, sacrificing certain uh, uh, sub-manifolds, for example, you can see here, in favor of generating less up-manifold uh, regions. And you can imagine this thing can get uh, quite nasty as we go to higher dimensions and uh, like uh, it, the, the model may decide to completely ignore a submanifold and we'll see examples of that moving forward. And uh, the third consequence is uh, uh, based on the fact that several works has, uh, have shown that uh, basically if the uh, generator and the true distribution can become equal, they will remain equal. And this is called uh, local convergence. But in the case of uh, disconnected manifolds, uh, we just saw that the generator cannot generate the true data distribution. And what that means is that essentially the resulting equilibrium uh, will not be locally converged. So it will kind of like uh, move around and like won't converge. Okay. So now what can we do about all that? How can we solve this? Uh, the obvious solution is to make the function G discontinuous and we can do that quite easily by introducing multiple generators instead of one. And this has other benefits as well. It becomes like the system as a whole becomes more robust to bad initializations and it's more like suitable for parallelizations because we are introducing essentially an ensemble of models. Uh, so yeah, so basically we want to have a set of generators here denoted G of C and each of them go from the latent space to the uh, image space or data space. Uh, I'm just gonna move to the next slide and we'll come back. Uh, so here's a diagram of what we want. So this whole thing here on the left, this is our generator now. We have different generators, each generating a sample and then we choose which one of them we want to use at each sampling step based on a prior, uh, for now we assume this to be a uniform prior, which means that we uniformly choose one of these generators 
and then that becomes the output. So this whole thing becomes our generator. The only consideration here is that we need to make sure that these generators generate different things because otherwise uh, what happens is uh, all of these generators may share the generation of the whole disconnected manifold and we will end up being the, having all the issues that we had uh, starting with this uh, in this talk. So to do that, we can what we can do is we can uh, try to maximize the mutual information between each image and the generator that generated that. Okay, so coming back to this slide, so we want to maximize essentially mutual information between uh, the generator ID and the generated samples. So mutual information is not tractable here, but we can drive a variational lower bound for it, uh, shown here, uh, shown here uh, using an auxiliary distribution called uh, Q of C given X. Uh, and uh, this is basically approximating the true posterior uh, P of C given X. And uh, we model this with a neural network uh, shown here, which uh, basically gives us a categorical distribution uh, for each input uh, inputted image for data. So what happens here is basically uh, maximizing this term essentially uh, amounts to uh, training a classifier here, which tries to distinguish uh, images coming from different uh, generators, but also uh, maximizing the generator to generate images that can be uh, easily distinguished by this classifier. Uh, yeah. So moving to this diagram again, so we have the usual discriminator here, we have the generator here, and this is the classifier here. Basically here we train this classifier to be able to tell these different uh, samples, uh, these different uh, outputs of different generators apart, but we also train the generator uh, to not only uh, make sure that they generate samples that uh, are scored highly by the discriminator, so they look real to the discriminator, but are also easily distinguishable by this classifier. And that's basically what that uh, maximization of uh, mutual information amounts to. And uh, basically, like these are the uh, modified objectives. Uh, the only new thing is like. Uh, happening here and then here, this is a class part. Uh, and we use a prior, a uniform prior for PFC. Again, as a reminder, PFC is the probability uh, for selecting each of the generators that we have in a, in a complete generator. So here is uh, the example of, again, training this new model, which we call DMWGAN on the uh, uh, four line segment data that we had before. So this was what WGAN could generate, but now you can uh, we can see that interestingly, the, our new model uh, is able to learn the correct distribution. Uh, so, but one thing to note here, uh, this is cool, but note that we have actually chosen exactly the right number of generators here. So we know that there existed four submanifolds and we have chosen to use four generators and each of them has generated one of these uh, uh, submanifolds. Uh, but what happens uh, if we don't know that? So if we don't know this number, which is the, uh, what happens in reality, because given a data set, we don't really know how many submanifolds uh, it has. So here's basically what happens. If we choose, uh, so n, G, n sub g shows the number of generators that we use in, in our model and n sub r shows the true number of uh, submanifolds that exist in the data. So if we choose a, a smaller number, what happens is uh, some generators will have to cover several data submanifolds. So we'll have the issue uh, that we had before of having to cover multiple uh, uh, submanifolds. And here on the right, we are training on the slightly different data set. This is the same data set uh, as before, the same uh, real data uh, manifold as we're seeing here, except that this time we are uh, sampling from the top right line segment with 0.7 probability and with 0.1 probability from each of the other uh, line segments. So it becomes an unbalanced version of this data set. So you can see that in case of the unbalanced data set, the situation is like uh, much worse. Okay, uh, so that was when we chose uh, NG to be uh, smaller. Uh, what if we choose uh, more number of generators than the number of submanifolds that actually exist in the data? Here, what happens is that uh, since we are putting a uniform prior over the generators, 
uh, uh, several generators have to share a single data submanifold. So on the left, you can see that, for example, this generator, um, by the way, the colors uh, uh, mean, uh, like identify different generators that are used in our model. So for example, pink and blue are outputs from two different generators uh, in the, like, uh, in their multi-generator model. Uh, so here you can see that these two had to share this uh, submanifold, and because we had like 10 uh, uh, generators, some of them had to go somewhere. So some of them have uh, chosen to like fall here and again, like during off submanifold, off -manifold samples. Uh, but uh, we, we also like see in the case of the unbalanced line segment uh, experiment, that in this case, since we had 0.7 probability placed on the top right line segment, uh, essentially, uh, seven of the generators had to share this uh, uh, line segment in order to be able to place 0.7 probability there because we're selecting these 10 generators with equal probability so each of them carry only 0.1 probability and as a result you can clearly see that mode dropping has happened here we have these gaps between them because we're making through the uh, mutual information maximization we are making sure that their uh, support is disjoint. So uh, we end up getting this situation. So even, and even if we, sorry, uh, even if we choose the number correctly, uh, like this will work fine in case of a balanced data set, but you can see again, like uh, the same the same bad situation happening in the uh, case of the unbalanced data set because multiple of the generators have to focus on this top right one to provide that 0.7 uh, probability over there. So all these cases are essentially uh, showing the failures of the model that we designed. And now we want to think about what to do about that. Uh, so here we first assume that we can always choose uh, the number of generators higher than the actual number that exists in the uh, data. And uh, so this can be like, a, uh, this becomes essentially a uh, trade-off depending on how much uh, computational budget we have, we can choose as, as much as we uh, we can afford, uh, as many uh, like generators as we can afford. Uh, and here we are interested in basically figuring out the correct prior. That's why this is called prior learning. And what we can simply do is noting that uh, like we had this auxiliary uh, queue which was approximating the posterior over uh, the generators. And we can use that to uh, actually compute this prior uh, as well. So we take an uh, EM approach, essentially, where in the expectation space, uh, step, we uh, simply can compute the expected value of this Q over the real data to get uh, like basically how important each generator is and how much we should be sampling it. And then in the maximization space, we're simply using this prior, uh, this expected prior to uh, train our model and we uh, iteratively just uh, go between the E and M step. Uh, but, uh, so this is nice, but there's only one uh, consideration here and that's the, that we don't really want to compute this uh, prior as, an as a direct expectation. Uh, and uh, I'll discuss in a moment why that is. Uh, so instead, what we do is we model it with a, uh, basically as a softmax function over uh, NG parameters. And we try to learn this model. Uh, so the learning of this uh, model, which we now call uh, RFC, given these parameters, is quite easy. We just maximize its, uh, uh, sorry, minimize its uh, cross entropy with the actual PFC that we wanted to learn, and it basically becomes this form in uh, in the impl implementation. Now coming back to why we need to do that, why not just compute the uh, empirical expectation? Uh, the reason is uh, if we computed this prior in this way from the start of the uh, learning, some generators, uh, which are still mostly random at the start, uh, may not get a chance to learn anything. So we may basically uh, prematurely vanish their contribution to our model. So now that we have a uh, basically a learnable model, what we can do is we can introduce this uh, entropy term here, an, an entropy uh, penalizer essentially, to make sure that this prior moves away from the uniform prior in a smooth fashion. Uh, so basically that's the whole point why we wanted to be able to uh, make this prior learnable rather than just taking the expectation. Uh, 
And uh, this prior is essentially like uh, just a penalty, as I said, and it's not very sensitive to the choices of uh, these uh, decaying factor, alpha or the weight, uh, as long as the transition is smooth. And uh, like uh, all our modifications, since they're done in the internal structure of G, we can still, uh, like all the uh, convergence proofs uh, still hold as before, uh, and they're not affected. So finally, here is the result of uh, our new DMW GAN prior learning model. Here we are again, if you remember the previous setup that we looked at, we had 10 generators and we we're trying to learn this balanced line segment data set. We ended up having this situation. Uh, now in the middle, this is our new model. You can see that the, uh, uh, the, the model has uh, correctly learned to remove the contribution of the redundant generator. So we have 10 generators, it has only kept four of them. And the colors here are basically, again, each generator that's kept in the training. And then on the right, you, you can see the uh, prior learning happening during iterations. So on the x-axis, we have uh, different iterations of training. And you can see as the training has moved on, it has gradually uh, vanished the contribution of uh, redundant generators, and it has kept uh, some of the generators that were useful and were learning the correct uh, submanifold. And these uh, colors are corresponding between these, plot, these two plots. And uh, so this is the case for the unbalanced line segment. Uh, again, this was the failure situation we had. Now we no longer have that. And interestingly, you can see that without an explicit supervision, the model has figured out that one of the generators had to be selected with 0.7 probability, which is exactly the probability that we had placed on the line segment. I just want to point out that uh, it, it's interesting that the model is able to uh, learn that on its own without an explicit uh, supervision. Uh, so this is just the algorithm for reference, if uh, we can come back to it. Uh, so here is a training on the like uh, MNIST data set, a more real data set. You can see that a regular GAN is generating these up manifold samples that are like weird mashup of different numbers. Uh, but this uh, the model we proposed no longer generates those kind of samples. Uh, and to quantify that, we we uh, introduced two measures. There's a uh, sample quality measure, which is essentially uh, if we had a classifier that could classify uh, different digits. Uh, what support, uh, what's the ratio of samples that it will classify with high uh, confidence? It's a measure of like how good is the quality of our sample. And then we have a uh, geodesic distance measure, which is kind of, uh, which is measuring uh, e on each digit, uh, which represent each submanifold uh, in this case, uh, how much of the variations we have uh, captured. So this is a, like, this uh, essentially tells us how much more dropping is happening. And in both cases, higher numbers are better. Uh, so here are the results on MNIST. Uh, the green one shows the uh, WGAN. Uh, the orange one is the uh, new model DMWGAN with prior learning. And the blue is essentially the gold standard, the actual real data. And in all cases, uh, you can see that the uh, new model both has a lower, uh, uh, both has better uh, uh, variation over each uh, submanifold and has better uh, sample quality. Uh, and then this is like a plot of the prior learning happening over the uh, MNIST data set. Again, you can uh, here we are doing, uh, we are using 20 generators where there is only 10 digits. And you can see that the model has figured out that it only needs to keep exactly 10, 10 generators in the, uh, uh, in the generator and it has vanished the contribution of the redundant ones. And here we are showing in each column the uh, outputs of each of those generators that has remained, uh, basically their uh, prior has not uh, has not vanished. Okay, and this is more uh, uh, like training on real data sets. So this is uh, like a, we combine a data set of uh, faces and bedrooms and we train a WGAN on it. As you can clearly see, uh, the, the mashup of faces and uh, bedrooms are happening here, here, here as we expected, because this is a disconnected manifold situation. And uh, then we, when we learn it with a prior learning uh, model, we use five generators and uh, the generators. Uh, so this is the case where uh, we had a failure as we saw before, like without the prior learning, the, the model ends up creating completely off manifold samples. Uh, 
But then with prior learning, we no longer have uh, mashups or completely off manifold samples. And here you can see the generators that have been uh, basically dropped from training, like these first three columns. Uh, and again, this is a look at the prior learning happening with the model that we train on the basis data set. And finally, these are like some uh, uh, quantitative measures of quality. And you, we kind of show that uh, with these uh, like aggregate uh, qualitative, quantitative comparisons, uh, the, the model that we propose outperforms the other existing models. Uh, so yeah, that's basically the end of the discussion on the uh, uh, on the disconnected manifold. So I just want to wait a couple of minutes here if there's any uh, questions, uh, and then I can move on. Okay. Uh, okay. Looks like we're good. Uh, so moving on to this uh, second bias that we are going to discuss, here we ask the question of can GANs learn all frequencies equally well? So uh, basically the, uh, the uh, issue here is that information can be anywhere in, uh, in different frequencies. Uh, and uh, it's important to know whether these generative models can generate all of them uh, as good. Uh, for example, here we are showing like images and underneath them uh, like low uh, frequency bands, mid frequency bands and high frequency bands. So to clarify what we mean by these spatial frequency components, uh, we can consider basically images to be periodic uh, beyond image boundaries. And then based on the discrete Fourier transform, we can write a, a 2D, 2D digital image as a sum of uh, complex sinusoid. And then here basically C of UV will be the complex amplitude of each sinusoid. And we call this whole thing a spatial frequency component. And here, essentially, uh, U, of v, U and V give us the direction of that component, uh, and uh, the uh, and its magnitude give us the actual frequency of that component. And for ease of discussion, we normalize this U and V by the uh, width and height of the image, uh, so we get basically U hat and V hat here. And in this case, uh, our uh, frequencies will be in the units of cycles per pixel. Uh, and here we're showing some samples from different, uh, these are real components. Uh, so on, on different rows, we have different frequencies and on different columns, we have uh, uh, different directions essentially. Uh, so we are kind of loosely from this point on refer to uh, the components that have you had or we had close to half cycles per pixel. This is the most, uh, this is the highest frequency possible uh, due to Nyquist. Uh, as the high frequencies and with uh, the ones with you had or we had close to zero as low frequencies. So we want to essentially know if uh, the GAN is the GAN is able to generate these low the, these high frequencies as well as these low frequencies. All right, so this is a uh, kind of a motivating example here. Uh, here we take, we construct a data set of uh, Coke snowflakes of level five and resolution 1024 by 1024. So this is a fractal database and we randomly rotate the snowflakes to create a, a data set, a variation. And on the left, we are showing the power spectrum of uh, this data set, the average power spectrum of this data set. And these windows basically zoom into this uh, spectrum. And here we are showing a, a sample from the perimeter of the snowflake as well. Uh, just to clarify like where everything is in this uh, spectrum, on the x axis we have u hat, on the y axis we have the v hat, basically the two components. So that means that closer to the center, we'll have our lower frequencies, closer to the corners, we'll have our higher frequencies. And the colors correspond to the power, that, uh, power of that frequency component. And as you can like, and then on the right, this is uh, the average power spectrum of training a star GAN to a state of the art GAN model on this data set. As you can clearly see comparing these two uh, uh, spectrums, uh, while the low frequencies are matched pretty well, in high frequencies, we're completely losing data. So we are losing structure. Uh, and that's kind of the motivating example that GANs actually do not learn the high frequencies as well as the uh, low frequencies. Uh, but while comparing average power spectrum uh, is nice, it's not really that informative. What we really want to know is whether distributions carried by each frequency components are uh, 
are learned very well, not just the average power spectrum of them. And so what we can do is uh, use a, uh, a basically distribution distance here, the fresh inception distance, which essentially com uh, computes the distance between uh, two sets of features extracted from two distributions. Uh, and basically it gives us a, gives us a value uh, that's if it's, uh, uh, it's basically a distance, so lower is better. Uh, but the problem with FID is that it has no spectral resolution. So it considers the whole uh, spectrum uh, together. Uh, to give it a spectral resolution, what we can do is simply uh, gradually remove uh, low frequency bands and compute FID at this stage. So basically, if we have two sets of images we want to compare, we like apply a, 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 a Gaussian filter with uh, uh, a, a low pass uh, Gaussian filter. Uh, sorry, a high pass uh, Gaussian filter with uh, in increasing the band, and then we uh, compute the FID between them. Uh, and uh, what we expect to see is uh, a basically declining FID levels plot, because what happens is as we remove low frequencies from the data, we're essentially uh, removing information. And if you imagine the limits, the whole information is removed, and the two uh, set of images will look exactly the same. So we expect a declining flat essentially. And here is just confirming that. So we take uh, two subsets of a phase uh, data set and we apply uh, noise uh, to different frequency bands of one of the sets and compare with the other one, just to confirm the behavior of these FID levels that we're uh, proposing here. So on the left, we're just adding uh, noise to low frequency. Uh, and as you can see, like, and these are different uh, signal to noise ratios. And in all cases, the plots go down uh, as we expected, meaning that if uh, there is more mismatch in low frequencies, as we remove them, uh, they, they become more similar as we expect. Same thing happens if there is, uh, uh, we add the, the noise to the full spectrum, uh, again, from our, uh, our discussion in the previous slide. But if the noise exists in the high frequency band uh, here, you can see that we get these uh, rising plots, meaning that as we kind of remove the low frequencies, the difference is amplified in the eyes of the FID. And this is kind of what, if we see this, we expect, we can kind of uh, expect the model to be biased uh, towards uh, low frequencies. So given those observations, now we train uh, three uh, set of the art GANs on two data sets, a data set of faces and a data set of bedrooms images uh, of 12800 by 28 resolution, and we compute the FID levels. In almost all cases, you can see kind of this uh, increase in the plot. And one thing to note is that if we continue like doing this plot moving forward on the x-axis, all plots will eventually like uh, collapse, collapse down because we remove all the information. But this is just the uh, kind of uh, the first evidence that there is a problem with higher frequency, with generating higher frequencies. Uh, but the problem with the previous uh, situation, so basically here, is that we could say, okay, yes, GANs are biased, but this is because our data itself was biased because the data that we trained these models on had more uh, prominent low frequencies than high frequencies. So to confirm that this is actually not what's happening, uh, we directly look at whether uh, GANs are indifferent to a shift in the spectrum of data. So we take the data, for example, the Salabea spectrum shown here, we just apply a, uh, a phase shift operator to, uh, to basically swap the high and low frequencies. So basically we multiply each image by this cosine channel Y and we create shifted versions of our data set. So basically this is what happens. The low frequencies are now placed at the high frequencies. Uh, what I want to uh, emphasize here is that we are not really changing the distribution. Uh, we, we're, we're just changing the uh, uh, the, the carrier signal, the carrier components that are carrying those distributions. So if basically a, the argument here is that if GANs are not biased, we expect their performance to be uh, unaffected by this shift. So th they shouldn't notice that something has happened to the data. But what we see when we train, again, all three models on the two shifted data sets, so here is celebrate, here is shifted celebrate, the performance degrades significantly. Uh, with respect to both uh, the FID value and LR is a measure of uh, uh, a measure of uh, basically uh, average power spectrum difference. Uh, 
Uh, and it consistently happens for all the GANs in all the distributions and uh, in all the data sets. And what we can take away from that is that GANs are not uh, insensitive to this shit. So they are, in fact, uh, biased somehow towards uh, uh, low frequencies. And so then the natural question is, uh, OK, so what's happening there? Why that's the case? Uh, and that comes uh, like for uh, to basically pinpoint a problem, we can look at the structure of a convolutional neural network. Essentially, a convolutional neural network has, is a, like, uh, we can think of it in a simplified way as a uh, uh, as an application of different convolution layers, each of them being a, an affine transformation uh, applied to a, a gated and upsampled input. Uh, I'm going to just uh, jump ahead a little uh, from some of the build up to the final results and just discuss the final theorem. Uh, the final theorem here basically tells us that uh, between any two uh, locations on the spectrum of convolutional filters, there's a correlation that we can uh, measure uh, that with this uh, uh, term uh, here. And the interesting thing here is that, uh, well, there's an obvious observation here, and that's if we increase this here in basically KL is the uh, size of the filter itself, and DL is the size of the output dimension that this filter is, uh, the output uh, image or data that this uh, uh, filter is generating. The obvious observation here is that if we increase KL, this correlation will decrease. So larger filters, uh, like less uh, correlation in the filters. But uh, the more nuanced observation here is that if we increase DL, uh, uh, meaning the size of the output dimension, uh, what happens here is that the correlation between them uh, will increase as well. Uh, so we know, so this is a corollary to just make our discussions easier. Uh, the same things hold for the actual theorem. But we are plotting basically this function. This is uh, here. Uh, this is a simplified version of the theorem we saw before. And you can see in the dotted line how it changes as we increase DL. Uh, and these orange dots are actually like uh, compute this value computed on a train W net. So uh, all in all, what this means is that higher output dimensions, more correlations in the spectrum of filters. But how does that affect the generation of high frequencies? Uh, what we know from the structure of a convolutional neural network is that high frequencies due to Nyquist are mainly generated in the outer layers uh, without, without uh, aliasing. So the outer layers are the ones that can generate these frequencies for us without aliasing them. Uh, and what that means, uh, and like incidentally, these outer layers of the convolution networks are the ones that have the highest value of DL, the highest output uh, spatial dimension. And what that means, as we just saw from the theorem, is that these filters will contain more correlation in, the, in their spectrum. Now, what that correlation means is that they cannot become as sharp as you want them to be. So if, if they start to change that part of their spectrum, the other parts will change as well. And that, like, at the end of the day, what that means here is that uh, these filters that are generating uh, high frequencies are more restricted in the, in the shape of the filter that can learn compared to the filters that are generating low frequencies. And that's uh, what this theory is tel telling us is the cause of the bias that we see. Uh, so basically what we want to, uh, what I want to point out here as the last piece of this talk is that, uh, so if that's really the case, what can we do about it? So one simple thing to do is just to build bigger models, so larger filters, so we can uh, reduce the correlation. But that comes at the cost of generalization issues and more computational budget. It also is impractical in case of higher resolutions that you know, data that inherently con contains very high uh, spatial frequencies. Uh, so we ask the question of can we maybe more directly improve just certain frequencies of interest. And that leads us, leads us to this idea of what if uh, we just generate uh, high frequencies as low frequencies by these generators and then shift them with a layer directly to the target frequency that we're interested in. So what happens is we generate high frequencies as low frequencies and then we shift, shift them into place. So that shifting is pretty easy. It's just uh, applying another phase shift operator here and v sub t and v sub t here are basically the targets that we want to uh, we want to generate better, uh, the target frequencies. 
there is one problem here, and that's the fact that higher high frequency bands are not necessarily symmetric, so they might be asymmetric. But when we generate something at as low frequencies, uh, that uh, like that spectrum will be symmetric. So in order to solve this, we need our generator to be generating a complex signal, so that when we shift it, it can be uh, uh, asymmetric at higher frequencies. So th that's pretty straightforward. We just introduced two channels of generation, a G sub R and G sub I, for the real and imaginary part of this complex generator. So now the output of the generator is actually two images corresponding to the real and imaginary part of the signal. And then we shift that, and we call that GFS. And then the real part of GFS, which has this form, will be able to generate any high frequency band at low frequencies and has a bias towards to the target that we wanted to. So it basically takes this term. And what this means is that, again, we are just modifying the internal architecture of the generator. We're just adding a layer that performs this thing, and everything else is the same in the training of the gas. Um, and as a result of that, if we choose our target frequencies correctly, uh, we can see that this idea actually works. So we are able to improve the performance on the shifted data sets uh, to what we had before. Uh, and these are some samples. Uh, the most obvious uh, differences are uh, visible here between WGAN and WGAN GP. You can see like this is the uh, samples that we're generating on the shifted data set, and we're reshifting the samples to be able to visualize them. And this is the samples that now our new model with the frequency shifted generator is able to generate. So the, the improvement is quite stark. Uh, and the final thing is we also uh, want to know if we can target multiple frequencies at the same time by adding multiple of these models together. And again, we see that that does work. So the performance does improve shown here in the uh, by comparing the green line uh, in each of these uh, models. But uh, so one consideration here is, is this performance improvement coming from the shift that we have designed or is it just because we have given the model more capacity because we've added more generators together so to test that, we simply add the same amount, the same generators, but without the shift. And in that case, the uh, curving gray shows the result of that. Uh, and we can see that here, the like we don't get the same performance, so, so the shift does matter. Uh, and the final thing here is that like each column here shows the generated samples uh, from this multiple FSG model, one generated sample. Uh, the, the image at the last row is the final image, which is the sum of all these generators above it. This one will be the main generator, and these are the generators that we have shifted to a specific target frequencies. What's interesting here is that these generators have learned to focus on the exact target frequencies that we have uh, added to their layers. Again, like this is without any supervision during training. So we are not explicitly forcing the model to learn these explicit, these specific uh, frequencies, but the model is learning them because they're biased. So this is more evidence towards the biasness because if, the, if these uh, uh, generators that we're adding together weren't biased, they wouldn't have any incentive to focus on any specific frequencies. They could all just share in some way the generation of uh, images. So these are just more samples from uh, the different uh, models. And uh, with that, I uh, conclude that talk and thank you for listening. Sorry, like they got, uh, if I like give, uh, discuss too many information and just, uh, I'm happy to hear your question. Thank you, Mahia. This was very interesting. Um, does anybody have any questions? We have a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can. Uh... Uh, ask a question or two. Um, so let's see uh, where to start. <laughs> Actually, probably more than we could do. Um, the first one is just like a very kind of practical question about the first about the uh, the first part with the disconnected manifolds. Um, does it? <laughs> so I I kind of th th this intuition makes sense to me that there should be disconnected manifolds, and, and of course, if it's continuous distribution that you can't get it, there's going to be some like little tether between uh, between the two. Is it really, uh, is it in practice like really a big problem that this that, that there's like a, a tiny bit of density that goes between these two? Or, uh, I, I mean, yeah. I guess in your, in your no, no, I, examples, I, I, it, it, was a, it was a problem. Uh, so I guess uh, th that's probably the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, it's a, there's definitely like a problem here. For example, like if you want to learn this distribution and you learn something like that in the middle and like this is a synthetic uh, example, but what happens is that in reality, people are right now using these uh, models to, for example, replace uh, like particle uh, simulations or like to uh, discover like new protein uh, structures. And what these kind of results show is that if you're not careful with the model that you're using, you might end up generating like proteins that you have no way of figuring out, okay, that these are completely nonsense. These weren't part of the manifold that our data were coming from. These are just byproducts of this issue that the model wanted to learn like this kind of manifold, but it ends up generating like these uh, completely nonsense samples. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I really, one thing I like about all your work is the, this like uh, construction of clever synthetic examples so we can see what the real shortcomings of these methods are. Uh, and so for the spectral thing too, that really surprised me because my impression or my intuition was always that GANs are better at producing sharp details and images, which I would have thought was correlated to working better on the high frequency uh, spectrum. Um, but it seems like your results show just the opposite, mm -hmm. that they're actually better at the low frequency part. Do, do you have any intuition about um, ab about that, like why they seem to be right? Right. So, so this example, you know, says, so, so, oh, this, uh, this thing is bad at high frequency and it's getting kind of fuzzy details at the edges. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, yeah, so like the, the intuition kind of, I, uh, I try to capture that in the theorem. It's kind of like the way you, we really st structure these generative models. So these like convolutional generative models are basically, if you really think, like look at the history of where they came from, people just took the discriminative uh, like convolutional networks and just flipped them. I never thought about, okay, what does, does that really make sense? Is it like what, what we want to do? And what happens is when you flip them in a generative process, since you're actually like generating a spatial signal, uh, it really matters where that signal is being generated. So in a convolutional network, the, uh, the high frequencies uh, are basically only generated by the outer layers because what happens is uh, your inner layers uh, give you out, like basically give you a smaller output. So they go from, for example, uh, four by four to 16 by 16 to 32 by 32 and they grow that. Uh, what that means is that th those, like, uh, if you're generating a signal at four by four, essentially you are, uh, th these would become like the low frequencies for you at the end. And your model has a lot of chance through all these layers to modify that low frequencies because all these layers can change those frequencies. But the higher frequencies are only generatable by the outer layer. So the very last couple of layers are the ones that are actually able to generate for you the very fine details. And they don't get as much capacity as the ones that are generating the low frequencies. And that's fine in images because where, well, most of the information is anyway in low frequencies. Even the ones that we think are like fine details are not really that fine. But if you want to train these on like very high resolution data and uh, like where high frequencies are really like important and like carrying information that you don't want to lose, then it really becomes a problem. So Greg, there is actually a nice paper from one of uh, Shifu's students a couple of years ago that kind of provides insights on why this is the case. Mainly, I, if I recall correctly, they are attributing this to the deconvolution layers at the end. And, and this is basically what Meyer was saying. But I, I, I want to take, I want to use this as a segue into something re related. Now, Meyer, if these GANs have these produce these kind of artifacts, especially at a high, higher frequency, can we use these to attribute um, uh, image samples to GANs? Can you, can we use this kind of artifacts to fingerprint GANs? Yes, they we can. And like uh, I, I know at least like two papers that I've already looked at this to just just looking at the like. Uh, average spectrum here, nothing fancy. You can basically tell that it images generated by GANs uh, and it's quite reliable. But what actually people have figured out that like the counter, like, uh, you know, the, the counter to counteract that kind of uh, fraud detection system, uh, people can simply just filter out the high frequencies because in images, high frequencies don't matter as much. So if like uh, you just uh, apply a low pass filter on your image, 
your image will become a little bit blurry, but not, not something that a human eye can detect. But that will kind of cue all the signal that a, like, uh, a, a detector would rely on. But interestingly, uh, from this uh, picture, uh, like from this uh, experiment, we, we can think about not just looking at the average power spectrum, but the spectrum that is actually learned on the low frequencies. And by that, we might be able to tell that this was generated by GAN because of, uh, like, as we saw, it's not just that the high frequencies will be missed. It's, it's that the training of lower frequencies will also be affected. And like, yeah, so like the short answer is, yeah, there is a lot of complications. Thank you. All right, for the interest of time, I'm sorry, we will not be able to take more questions because he has um, meetings with other people. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Mahir, for a very interesting uh, talk. And uh, um, Mora, he's yours. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.